All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. So we are now live on Facebook. Welcome to the third session of the Arctic Youth Network webinar series. Um, today's subject will be on stories through photography and filmmaking. And we have three great panelists joining us today. I'm really grateful that they were able to take some time in their holiday period to, to share their expertise uh, with us. So my name is Samantha. Um, I am a polar educator and I'll be moderating today's session. Now I am currently recording from the Ottawa and Gatineau Valley. I am on unceded Anishinaabe Algonquin territory and I'm very grateful to be able to be here and live in this land and be able to record this webinar for people across the circumpolar Arctic today. Now today's subject on uh, filmmaking and story making in the north is one that uh, we hold very dear here at the Arctic Youth Network. Um, I know there's a lot of our members that are creatives that are hoping to be able to share their stories or have already started sharing their stories in many ways through personal social media and even working all the way up to uh, international film festivals. So, you know, filmmaking and photography in the North, it, it will encompass, pardon me, um, a wide variety of views, of styles, of genres, um, and it can address many things like history of Indigenous cultures, the relationship between insiders and outsiders in the North, um, and even that creator's appropriation of the idea of using social media, of using um, these kinds of technologies to share their stories. And that's ultimately it. It's different forms of storytelling. Um, and he, us here at the Arctic Youth Network, we really believe in the power of storytelling, how those stories can impact young people and the people around them, how young people who use storytelling can have a part in creating more than just a more just and equitable world. Even in a rapidly changing North, stories can be used to speak the truth, to mobilize people and to even shift power. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker calling in from Montreal today. So I'd like to welcome Sinajak. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you. Thank you everyone for um, being here today. My name is Asin Nayak and I'm from Inuktuak, Nunavik. My parents are Carol Rowan and Joby Witaltok and um, they work in like child education and also filmmaking. Um, I'm a filmmaker, a um, artist, like curator, writer. I do lots of different things, um, but I went to university and I studied film there. Um, I have like loved art my whole entire life. And um, I like remember being really young and being interested in communication and how we can like communicate ideas in like a thorough way to each other. And um, I think like what I love about art and all the different kinds of um, different artistic expressions is the like ability to connect with each other through sharing like ideas. And um, I really love making art um, because it challenges me to like try and really understand like my thoughts and what's going on around me um, in a way that's like, like maybe I wouldn't challenge myself to do otherwise. And um, then like try to figure out how to like share that feeling or idea with um, other people. And like, I really love books and movies. And at some point, like I figured that um, 
what's powerful about like my favorite ones is that they um like transmit through feeling rather than like just facts and i think that like when it comes to like learning um one of the power most powerful tools that like that like i respect a lot is like the tool of um yeah trying to like get a feeling a feeling across like something that's past just facts and more into like something like that you feel like with your whole body um yeah so i study film and i learned a lot at school but i think like what i learned the most from was watching so many movies <laughs> and watching lots of different kinds of movies and um then also just the like trying cuz i think that's like how i always learned things is like watching a lot and then doing and making mistakes and working together with people so even though um i did go to university and study film i think that it's like the like what really changed my life in regard to like film was like just spending time watching studying and like trying um and i think like the last thing i wanted to say about um kind of like my relationship to my work is like one thing that i think um that's like really important to me is like when i'm making something i'm thinking about how that's taking someone's time and someone's giving giving me their time and to like honor and respect that by doing the best that i can and speaking really truthfully to my experience and just like giving each other respect sorry that was kind of a rude comment so No, I understand completely. If you expect someone to spend time with your work, you have to respect them as an audience, right? Um, I think that's really that's a really good point. Thanks so much, Asinayak. Now, if you're just joining us, um, either on Zoom or on Facebook Live, I wanted to let you all know that this session is recorded and will be made available on both the Arctic Youth Network org website um, and on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page. So you'll be able to find other, a recording of this, a transcript of this session. If for at any time, any time you have to leave us or your connection isn't ideal and you would like to come back to it, uh, we're trying our best to make these as available to anyone with any kind of broadband um, across the North. So thank you again. Thank you, Asina Yak. And I'd like to give the floor now to Acacia. Great. Um, hello, everyone. And um, thank you, Asiniak. I um, watched one of your films for the first time just the other week and was totally blown away. Like the soundscapes and everything just lingered in my consciousness for so long. And um, if, if any of you in the audience have not yet seen her films, I really encourage you to do so. Um, so um, my name is Acacia. I am a photographer artist and writer originally from Alaska. Um, I'm 30 years old now and um, the last 10 years I've been a photographer but also a guide on polar expedition ships, um, teaching people photography, traveling around parts of the Arctic and Antarctica. Um, so I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about my journey as a photographer um, at high speed, which will hopefully um, be useful to you if you're, if you're thinking that you might want to be a photographer yourself. Um, so with no further ado, I'm going to try to share my screen here. Just a second. There we go. Um, let's see. So um, again, I grew up here in, in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, I always felt, I think, a real 
um, deep connection to the northern landscape and that only intensified when I was an exchange student at the age of 17 um, to northern Norway to live in Narvik, uh, which is above the Arctic Circle, uh, for a year. And that was my first experience with, with kind of the, you know, Arctic winter and polar night and I just absolutely fell in love with it um, and started taking pictures at that time. Um, and so I think I've, I've gravitated towards photography because it is this way to, um, to preserve time in a way and to connect with the world and make that connection something that other people can access. Um, this is a camera that I like to use a lot of the time. Um, it's a four by five view camera. And so the negatives that it creates um, are, are this big, four by five inches wide. And um, I really like the idea using film that you are taking a moment in time and, and preserving that in silver. The light sensitive chemicals are made out of silver. And that seems to me to be a very like in, important way to work in a sense. Um, I don't only use this, like cell phones, digital cameras, anything you've got can absolutely um, be of use in photography. Um, and so now I have in the, I started kind of like as an art photographer. Now I'm more in sort of the um, photojournalism or documentary realm. Um, and so I'm going to tell you guys mostly about one particular um, project in, in my personal work that's very close to me. Um, so anyway, um, I will say at the front that you absolutely do not need to go to school to be a photographer. Um, Self-teaching, self-taught photographers do amazing work, absolutely. Um, but I did go to photography school and that was my first time really living like not in the North um, and quickly realized um, how many misconceptions there are about the far North and what what that is. <laughs> um, you know, assumptions that it's like a desolate wasteland, that nobody lives there. All of these things um, really inspired me to try to, to challenge that and to show the beauty um, of, the, of the North and especially the Arctic specifically within my work. And so um, I think my most of my artistic practice has been kind of a journey into trying to capture like the magic and beauty um, of the Arctic, but also exploring, you know, what, what human connections to it are. I mean, the Arctic is so diverse um, and there's, there's just a limitless amount to learn. Um, and so these, these are some of the first pictures that I was making when I first started out. And I would always write in my artist statements like, oh, the human connection to the Northern landscape. And at some point I realized like, who am I to talk about that, what that means? I've, my family's only been in Alaska for three generations. <laughs> um, I need to learn a lot more about this. Um, and so I applied for a grant um, to live in this wonderful community called Ikpiarduk or Arctic Bay um, on the north of Baffin Island in the Canadian Arctic, where if you don't know, um, the Inuit have lived in this region for an estimated 5,000 years. And this community, I think there's still um, elders there who grew up in a, in a mostly traditional lifestyle. So amazing um, cultural shifts and, and knowledge in this place. So I, uh, at 24, had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> um, I applied to do this like poetic landscape photography project um, about like sites in the landscape that had stories attached to them. I showed up and moved in with a local family, um, lived there for four months in the darkest part of the winter and just tried to to engage with people and, and be a part of daily life. And I quickly realized that my project idea had like no relevance <laughs> to people in this town. And so um, I ended up having a really amazing and life-changing experience. Um, and the photos that I made at that time ended up being more of a, um, a portrait of, of life in the winter. You know, I, I feel like I interact with a lot of people who have um, ideas that winter, Arctic winter is really horrible, when in fact, it's really wonderful and beautiful. This is a picture of the last day that we saw the sun before it set for three months. Um, and so through, this was the, my first time really being like an outsider in, in somebody else's community and culture. And I learned a lot of really valuable lessons and, you know, I'm still learning also. 
um, but a few of them that I wanted to share with you. If you are interested in photographing in places where you're not from, um, I think one of the most important things is to really spend time and build relationships with people. This is, by the way, Joy and Amelia getting ready for the Friday night dance. Um, but, you know, really spend a lot of time. Being a person comes first. Um, and letting go of any preconceived ideas that you might have about what your project is supposed to be about. You know, letting your experiences in a place guide that and, and listening to people and letting what you learn guide um, as you go along. Um, and so I also at this time experienced um, subsistence hunting for the first time, which I had no, I mean, I knew about, but you can't really, it was hard for me to understand what that meant before seeing it in person. And, um, you know, understanding like deeply that the health of the natural world influences your health and the health of like your community and everyone's well being is like a really critical thing <laughs> that I think really needs to be um, like elevated. Um, that mindset has just been unforgettable for me. Um, and I first learned it uh, seal hunting in the Arctic. <laughs> um, and so anyway, um, I, at the end of this experience, I really ended up with really, you know, this love for this place and, um, and a desire to learn more about um, people living in the Arctic and elevate those, those stories. Um, and so, by the way, I should probably mention real quick what, what a story is. Um, there's one thing to take pictures of things that, you know, make beautiful pictures. But I think in professional photography, it's really important that your, your photographs are consist as like bodies of work that are, you know, about an idea or a theme or a story, and the pictures go together to tell that story. Um, and so this, again, I was still kind of operating in this like art world of photography. Here's an exhibition that I had with some of these photographs um, at the Canadian Embassy um, in Washington, DC, which was a really great um, space for that exhibition because it was able to be kind of in context. I think context is really important too with photography. Um, and so at the opening, I was able to have like a panel discussion about important issues in the Canadian Arctic, et cetera. Um, so fast forward a few years, um, I started kind of all like falling into journalism. I mean, it never occurred to me that the things that I was photographing had a place in like the editorial world. And when I say that, I mean like magazines and newspapers and publications, like anytime that you see a, a photo that's published, like somebody was probably paid to take that photo. Um, like newsflash, you can actually have a career as a photographer that isn't solely an art form. Um, and so I, at that point, had been starting to work a little bit in that kind of stuff in more like conservation, environmental, and wildlife photography. Um, but I really wanted to go back to the Canadian Arctic and I couldn't get anybody to fund it. <laughs> so I applied for grants and got rejected and fundraised for three years um, and eventually just went back on my own um, because I wanted to reconnect with the people uh, who I knew there. And, and especially in the springtime, um, whenever all the kids get out of school and everybody goes out on the land um, to ensure that that all the kids and young people have an opportunity to learn traditional skills and subsistence hunting and land skills um, passed on from the elders. Here is a, a camp that the school organized um, so that everybody can have access to, um, to these opportunities. This is an elder teaching girls how to make bannock and passing on um, like lessons around feeding a family with limited resources. Um, and so this, and here's my friend Darcy pulling a toy skidoo for his daughter during a tea break on a fishing trip. Um, so it was so wonderful to be out with people, you know, after that, after wintertime, really in the time of year when there's the return of life and everybody is out on the ice and on the land. And I think part of what motivated me um, to do these pictures aside from, um, from just wanting to go back and reconnect with friends, um, was a desire to make photographs about the importance of sea ice to people in a way. Like, you know, so often we see just a photo of like a polar bear floating away on a tiny iceberg and we're like bemoaning the loss of sea ice. But I think that there's such a space for like 
empathy and compassion and like celebrating the richness of, you know, for example, sea ice and traditions that still um, are, are tied to that, and or not even traditions, just ways of life. Um, and so it was a real privilege to be able to travel um, with friends and to make those photographs. Um, and this is uh, Horizon, 11 years old, I think at the time, getting a high five from her aunt who lives in Ottawa after catching her first seal. Um, I love this picture. So anyway, um, it was only after this, <laughs> that um, this project, that I really started to, to kind of like get a, a foothold in the editorial world and realize like how, how much, um, you know, context matters, I think. And so I had um, some of these photographs were eventually published in National Geographic magazine, which was like a huge deal um, for me as a photographer. It's like everybody's dream, you know, but I wanted to, and it was, it was sort of these like dreamy land photos, but then I had this um, story in NPR that was about um, food security in Nunavut and the importance of traditional foods, foods in that context. And I realized that as confident as I had felt as a photographer, I had felt kind of um, sometimes a little bit hesitant to really put like my words behind the stories because I was so afraid of doing it wrong. I was like, who am I to tell this? Um, but I realized, you know, like food security, that's at least one thing where I felt pretty confident that I knew that that was really important. Um, and this, so this was not just like, you know, dreamy photos, but also just like real life stuff. Like, what are the food prices in the grocery store? What does it, you know, look like? I remember the editor was so interested in this photo of just like the sea ice edge, with all the Kamujiks and the skidoos parked. Um, or like what a community feast actually looks like in the winter. And I bring this up because this story for me had probably the most um, the best feedback that I have ever received and seemed like it was doing the most good um, for the community that I had been working in. And so it was sort of this wake up call of like, not everything needs to be art all the time. And if you like speak up and use your voice about things that are important, um, photography can really have impact, um, positive impact in the ways that we think about the Arctic and are aware of important things that are taking place there. And so that's where I kind of want to turn it around to you guys, um, northern photographers out there, because you guys are the experts. Um, if you, you know, no matter where you live, you will be aware of stories and, um, and issues, but also, you know, access to um, your communities that no outsider photographer could ever have. And so I really want to encourage you, if you are interested at all in, in photography and sharing your stories, um, to absolutely pursue that. Um, photography is not only like a tool for raising like urgent issues, but also like beautiful stories of, of empathy and compassion that we absolutely need when we're talking about the Arctic. Um, and so on that note, um, I have assembled some tips for aspiring photographers. Uh, the first one I would say just take pictures, start where you are. You don't need fancy equipment. Like even I know people who work for National Geographic who just use a cell phone. Um, and second would be to find a story or project that you're passionate about and put time and heart into it. Um, I think it, time is really underestimated there and sometimes a personal story can really come to life beautifully. I would say look for a mentor. Um, mentorship is really important. Reach out to people that you admire. Um, find people to give you feedback. How like sometimes as a photographer, we know the context of an image, um, but that needs to come through in the image as well. And a mentor can help you like feel that out. And then I'd say, try to learn everything you can. Look for workshops, read interviews, try to network however possible. Um, once you've got like a little bit of of a body of work, I would recommend having an online presence. Instagram is really big right now. If you have something you really wanna show, having a personal website can be helpful. Um, and when you feel ready, apply for things. I mean, grants, contests, all kinds of opportunities. Um, if you don't ask, the answer will always be no. <laughs> Lesson learned. Um, and finally, um, be patient. Uh, the best stories take time, but I would uh, just return again 
to the idea that, you know, the Arctic is, is I think, widely misunderstood. There are so many super important stories. And you, as young people in the Arctic, you are the experts and you absolutely have the tools to tell those stories. Um, so I'm going to attach uh, resources later to, I think, one of the posted videos, but just really quick, a few of these, um, just explaining what this is. The, the media industry, I think, has been typically through history dominated by kind of like a male Western perspective. And these are some kind of groups, databases of photographers that exist to elevate um, people who don't fit within that male Western um, perspective. And there, so I would check out the photographers and the resources there um, on your own time. Um, I also found some specific mentorship opportunities in Canada um, for indigenous um, people who might want to become reporters. Uh, Girls Who Click is for um, women who might want to become conservation, wildlife or environmental photographers. And then Women Photographs as itself, all you ladies out there. Uh, finally, there is one festival that is specifically devoted to elevating stories of the Circumpolar North from a Northern perspective, and that is the Far North Photo Festival. I have a feeling that there's like more of this stuff that's building that is coming in the future. So um, it's an exciting time and stay tuned. And if any of you would like to contact me after this, uh, there is my info just there. So I'm sure I went over time. Thank you for listening. Excellent. Thank you so much, Acacia. That was fantastic. And you didn't go very much over time. Don't worry about it at all. Um, so all those resources will be shared um, after the webinar. We'll have them um, either as links underneath in the comments um, or on the YouTube video. They'll be in the description. So we'll make sure to find, have all those things be available uh, as possible for anyone who'd like to find, go through those links. Um, and speaking of festivals, I'm sure uh, Asinayat can talk a little bit about having to create festivals and things like that. But before we go forward towards the uh, discussion portion of this presentation, I'd like to introduce our third and final panelist calling us from quite far north. Hello, Ivan. Can you hear me? Hello. Uh, yes, I can. Um, I'm not sure if my microphone is too loud. Um, no, it's... I... Okay. Um, so Eben, if you, if you, I know your connection is a little bit slow, but if you'd like, could you please turn on your video for the speaking portion and the rest of us will close our videos to really maximize your streaming as much as possible, all right? Uh, yes. So do please start with introducing yourself and letting us know where you're calling from. Um, my name is Eben William Hobson. I'm from Utkerevik, Alaska. Um, I started uh, doing photography and doing filmmaking uh, when I was a freshman and junior in high school. Um, I started take pictures for the local high school basketball team in 2014 and when i was a junior school i moved on to doing filmmaking and during those uh years in high school i i had saw and i noticed uh, a lack of indigenous representation in, in worldwide media um indigenous people being featured uh being involved and being interviewed so ever since uh, 2014, I've been working as a self-taught photographer. Um, I was inspired from outside uh, traveling photographers who came to the village and uh, photographed um, everyday stuff like the plants, the ocean, uh, polar bears, and caribou. Um, one of the challenges that I that I saw um, being a photographer and filmmaker that that's just or that's uh, just starting out and um, not knowing what to do um, i I was invited to a workshop um, and 
I did some research on on uh, on what 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 equipment I needed to make films. Uh, and during that workshop, I I titled a film uh, a, a film called Climate Change, um, and that gave me the insight on what it uh, takes to uh, to provide a, a studio level video. Um, that taught me how to set up lighting, set up uh, audio, do do the proper video work, and properly edit a video. And ever since um, that workshop, I've been traveling out outside of my community, uh, hunting and fishing, to to also capture some videos and pictures of of the animals and, and wildlife that I see uh, around town. Um, the The reason why that I pursued photography and filmmaking is to make content from an Inuit point of view, uh, show the true Arctic and not what is seen on TV and magazines. Um, like uh, polar bears are dying, seals are going extinct, whaling is bad, uh, subsistence hunting is bad, and having knowledge from actively hunting and fishing to try and correct those common misconceptions when thinking about or talking about the Arctic with videos and pictures to try and try and uh, teach the city folk with the, the knowledge passed down from elders. Um, another challenge that I, another challenge that I, uh, I was uh, scared of being uh, criticized for, for my work. Um, but I, but I realized that, that the worst they can say to me is no. And that is one thing that I'm still trying to trying to learn today is that I shouldn't be scared of you know teaching a project to a friend or, uh, or to their input and asking around people or uh, asking around town asking people what what um, the Hello, my, uh, my video just went out. Oh, we can um, hear you. I'm you, not you, sure if I'm still connected. We can still hear you. Okay. Your video did drop out though, but we can still hear you. Okay. Um, what I realized is that the worst that people can say to you as a young photographer and a young filmmaker is, is no. Um, one thing that I'm still learning uh, today is that um, I shouldn't be scared of people criti uh, criticizing my work, um, whether it's photos or videos. And I shouldn't be scared of asking people uh, here in town what they think of the project, if, th if they want to be a part of the project. Um, and that, that's one thing that I want to tell the, tell the young or tell other, tell other young uh, photographers and filmmakers that are, either of the north or live in northern areas um, in, no, in, in Alaska or Canada or Finland. Um, one thing that I, that I want to tell, tell, uh, tell those beginner uh, content creators is that the best camera that you have is the one that's in your pocket. And that is one thing that, um, that, um, one of my mentors told me, um, while working alongside him, um, and I feel like I've won over, uh, everything, everything that I, uh, went down or wrote, wrote down on, on my notebook. Um, this video is about 10 minutes long. I didn't realize that I would run through everything this this quick but i will leave this video in the in the chat uh or or a link to the video in in this chat um for everybody to check out um 
thank you for uh, for letting me be, be a part of this uh, webinar. Um, I really enjoyed listening to to Acacia and as and uh, a singer yuck and uh, what what they said um, kind of touched base with with what I wrote down um, and I really enjoyed listening to to what they had to say. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you're able to call us in. Um, I know the internet was a little bit difficult this morning. So um, for those who didn't catch that, uh, Evan is calling us from Botkavik in Northern Alaska. So um, I think that's kind of the question I would like to start today, this afternoon, this evening's um, moderated discussion. So now that we've heard from everybody, we are going to have a bit of a, just a sit down in a chat um, this isn't formalized, so anyone can ask questions to anyone. Um, I do please ask if you can, if you can turn on your camera now, it'd be nice to see everybody's face. Um, we'll be doing this in gallery view. Um, and I would like to launch that first question of um, bandwidth difficulty. And if having access to internet and faster in it, is that something that you would consider to be a limiting factor for young Northerners to get involved in photography and filmmaking as, a, as both a hobby and something that they can use creatively? Throwing that I think that um, when it comes to like internet, there's definitely um, limiting things to that um, but I think that like I guess like positive way that I see it is that it just changes the way that you like learn and interact with things so whereas like a lot of the world um, can access things like pretty quickly and see like a lot of different things um, maybe it's like a different experience like for my niece my niece like loves taking photos and when I like go home and hang out with her she like takes my camera and like goes running around everywhere taking pictures and like I just think um it's like you know what I mean it's like there's definitely something limiting but it's also a different experience and um yeah it depends on what you're looking for <laughs> I think um, what I've, at least in my experience, has seen is that social media, for example, is very important as a communication tool for people in the North. Um, certainly in Nunavut, um, all my friends are posting pictures all the time. And um, at least for me right now as a professional photographer, I think like my, my interaction with Instagram is maybe one of my most important ways to reach an audience. And so I think um, we are kind of like at a good time, like that is accessible to everyone. Um, and I think that um, the, that bandwidth is like probably accessible to most people. Um, but, but like um, Asinyak just said, maybe there, there are definitely still some limitations, I imagine. Well, so uh, oops, sorry, go uh, away, Ben. Sorry. Oh. Uh, so bandwidth is definitely an issue um, up here in the Arctic. Um, there are internet providers that are here uh, here in town. There, there are internet providers that have uh, some of the world's fastest internet at the palm of their hands, but they uh, they put restrictions on it and they offer really expensive prices for some of the slowest internet um, possible. Um, for me, when I'm downloading Photoshop or Premiere Pro on a new uh, desktop or laptop, it takes me about four or five days to finish that, that download. Um, when, when, I'm, uh, when I'm down in Anchorage, um, it, it takes a good 45 minutes, 30 minutes to, to complete. Um, and that, that really has limitations to 
how much I can upload, how much I can download, what I want to publish, what I what I can't really publish because the video is too long. Um, and so bandwidth for me and uh, internet connection for me is uh, it's a really big thing being a content creator wanting to push out more media, more photos, having the internet as a as like a wall in the in the journey to you know make edit and post and um, it's hard to to you know wait like 10 minutes for a post to, or a, a picture to post so internet is a is a really important thing for uh for publishing media. Now, all three of you talked about how filmmaking and photography can be deeply personal, right? It's something that, uh, and, and that's where maybe a little bit of the sh shyness and embarrassment of, you know, getting started can lie, is, is, is allowing yourself to be exposed through your filmmaking and through your work. Um, how have all three you, of you been able to overcome that, you know, that uncomfortableness of being seen and known through your storytelling? Maybe I'll ask Eben first, because he did touch upon it uh, during his presentation about how he was a little bit embarrassed initially to start posting. Uh, <clears throat> it's hard to explain. Um, it's kind of good, but also kind of weird. Because uh, you have people sharing your work here in town that you don't really know, but you see it, but but you see them around town, and they when they show your posts on, on social media, they like, wow, this is great, or wow, great job. And you, you see them around town, and they don't, they don't, they don't say anything to you. It's kind of weird uh, to have like a photographer personality uh, on Facebook or, or on Instagram, and living a totally different life, um, going hunting and fishing, and uh, trying to trying to provide uh, for your or for 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 my family and um, I mean it's it's weird but it's also like a good feeling because you're you're you you have a feeling of uh, of accomplishment and it you you just feel good on on uh, accomplishing that photo or the or or the video that that you had in mind. Um, I, I haven't given a talk like this in in about a year and a half, uh, so <laughs> I'm kind of rusty trying trying try, try, trying to talk um, over Zoom. Uh, but this is a really good, really good uh, webinar and really good to to listen to other speakers. Well, thank you very much, Evan. Don't worry about it. You're doing great. We really appreciate that you're able to connect with us today. Um, any of you ladies would like to speak to that? Yeah, I'll say that, um, you know, getting, getting over that fear is absolutely like just a part of the creative process. Um, even, even as you advance, I mean, it almost gets scarier the more people you have um, looking, I think. But um, I think that if you, if you feel, if you know that like the work is, is true to something that's, um, that's important to you, kind of eventually can like toughen up your skin and learn to just like disregard the, the criticisms that are, imp that are irrelevant to you and also to know when the criticisms are really important. Um, and so I think like for me, 
being in art school was certainly a crash course because you're getting critiqued every week <laughs> and you just learn, you know, you get a lot of criticism over time. Um, but I, I know that that's not like available to, to everyone. And so I think that, you know, just being really um, routine about asking for feedback um, is really important both from people who like are in um, in the photography world or also like in the place you're photographing and also people outside it um, and just like constantly bouncing things off different perspectives I think can help and um, and like I would just say that learning to deal with criticism and also to like have it help you is really a, a part of the creative process um, and so it shouldn't be scary even though it is um, um it's okay like everybody goes through it um and we're all kind of in it together in that sense um i don't think that i have much to add to that i think that i agree like i think one of the most important things that i learned um like i see it just said and that's like it's important to listen to criticism and it's important to know like where you stand and what's important to you and to know when to take the criticism and when to leave it, leave it to the side. And um, I think that like if you're driven to share a story, um, there must be something important in it. And um, that like everyone has their own unique way of experiencing life and um, that it's always interesting and valuable to have um, to, to hear um, each other's perspectives. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Um, no, I do have questions, but please, again, feel free to ask each other questions. Uh, three creatives in the room, it's always nice to let you guys bounce off each other. So feel free to interrupt me. <laughs> um, I do have some excellent questions coming in from the chat. So um, Holly Jones asks, how can you gather perspective and work with uh, different people on intergenerational projects, especially when you have potentially elders who are uh, maybe not so keen on being involved in photography and filmmaking? Um, is this something that you've faced and have to change projects around or how are you able to manage working intergenerationally? Well, I think one of the things that depends on for me is like how you see involvement because I think like for myself and just like my life in general and also like with artwork, um, like who I am is informed by like my family and the people who raised my family <laughs> and raised me. And so like in that way, I think like myself and my project is an intergenerational like long-term <laughs> project. And um, I think like sometimes working with elders means like speaking, learning, and then maybe like when, you know, maybe it's not exactly like hands on during photography or, or anything like that, but that's, that's what that made me think of is like, I think collaboration can look many different ways. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes it means like rethinking what that looks like and like going to each other. Like one of the things that like we have to think about a lot is if we want to include someone, it doesn't necessarily mean fitting them into my box. It means me reworking like how I work to, to fit someone else in. Excellent. Everyone is muted, so I'm guessing not jumping in into the question. Um, but I think that does cover most of it right. Both, you know, be your your box is not what needs to be checked. It's 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 making 
those things malleable and flexible to be able to include voices. And that inclusion doesn't necessarily mean, you know, sticking that camera in their face or having having them film exactly. It could it, that influence could be felt, you know, in a variety of different ways. Um, and I think that's really cool. Thanks so much. Um, I have a question directed towards Acacia um, from Rachel Bohr. And the question is relevant, I think, to a conversation that a lot of researchers are also having when they're working with communities. And that's how to make what you create accessible and have that stay within those communities. So to word her exactly, she says, what kind of access to your work do communities have? Though I know it's different, when we consider community-based research, a core part of that is that communities have full access to the research at the end. How do you think this translates to art, photography, and storytelling, especially as a non-Indigenous person working in Indigenous communities? <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously, that's um, this is something that's very important to me and something that I'm thinking about quite a lot. Um, I feel like for me, my my relationships with, um, in this case, just one community is probably more important to me than the actual pictures themselves. Um, but when I started out and, and still now, I always send prints of the photos um, to people um, when I'm done, when I get home and I have the access to be able to print them. Um, and I, sh I would also say, I think communication is really important. Um, if you're gonna take somebody's picture, it, that's kind of a big deal. Um, hard. I'm a very shy person in many respects. And so asking to take somebody's picture in the first place is kind of a big deal. Um, and, and so I try wherever possible to send people prints afterwards and to communicate um, if I want to publish them somewhere or exhibit them somewhere, asking permission and making sure it's okay. And maybe um, if the prints are not going to be used for anything afterwards, seeing if maybe it could be shipped to them, um, et cetera. But I'm I'm always, pretty much always thinking about how I am an outsider in this community and figure, trying to figure out how to do that better. Um, and I think I'm, I didn't mention I'm now actually in graduate school for writing. And I think part of my um, inspiration in doing that is that I felt like my photographs couldn't really tell the full story. Um, and I want to be able to tell it better. I think like constant improvement is like one of the joys of photography in a way. But um, I'm hoping someday, I'd like to go back, I'd like to make a book that, um, that includes people's stories in their own voices. Um, I'm getting a little bit off topic now, but one thing I also forgot to say earlier, if you are interested in like journalism type photography, might want to like record interviews with people. <laughs> I like didn't have that on my radar and being able to tell people's stories from in their own voices, the stories that they want to have told about them um, is pretty critical. And um, it would have been really helpful to have uh, interviews. So don't be afraid to talk to people, <laughs> ask permission, communicate, send photos. Um, I don't know about other places, but like for Nunavik, we have Avatar Cultural Center, which is like the place which makes archives and things available to Nunavut. So like if someone had a photo collection, they would bring it there and then I can go and access it. So like I, other places must have similar kind of setup where there's actually one place you can go bring research things to and then, and then they'll archive and make it accessible for their community. Is there anything like that in um, Utgavik, Iben, as well? Something that's kind of a, an archive or a museum that's trying to preserve those, those stories or even the things that you're creating in the community? There is uh, this museum called the, the Inupiat Heritage uh, Museum. Um, it's a really big place that has a lot of artifacts uh, showcased for tourists and people who want to come up here to Utkervik to, to, to check out the culture. Um, that's a really good place to, to get archives at. Um, they 
they have archives of traditional dancing, um, old footage of Utkiarvik and the surrounding villages, and photos of uh, the New York and Boston and New, Eng New England whalers that came up here in, in the 1800s. Um, so they, those photos and videos date back to, to a couple hundred years and they, they should be available to the public um, by a simple request form. Um, I've worked over there right after high school and it's a really big place. Um, they have a lot of uh, VCR tapes, uh, photos, and they have everything over there. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, that's where I learned most of my, my, uh, or that, that's where I learned the, the, the majority of, of my culture at, um, just by working over there and watching the footage and looking at pictures. Awesome. Really cool. Um, now, Akisha, you mentioned in your presentation earlier at the beginning of this video, um, uh, festivals and different organizations where people can get in touch. Um, I wonder if you can all speak to the importance of community building with, amongst creatives and um, if that's something that you think has been uh, a vital part of your own, own journey. Um, and I'd like Asina you know, to talk a little bit about your festival in Montreal as well. Um, and, you know, the obligatory COVID question, it, has it been difficult not having those communities and those, those gatherings this year? Creatively, or is this a really creative year actually, because you're not being bothered? <laughs> um, well, I think, so you asked about the festival that I started, it's called Teletechnik, and, um, we ran it for three years in Montreal, and um, I stopped running it while I figure out, I'm trying to figure out how to get it into like the hands of our Inuit association here, because I was like kind of running it <laughs> um, with an art gallery, and I want I want to like move it so it's not running right now, so COVID's not a problem. <laughs> um, but I think like, um, like as a urban Inuk, um, it was like it is really important for us to like have our community and to like be able to stay in contact with each other. And um, the festival, um, I think, is a really important thing that we started. Basically, we started for um, a lack of kind of support for like Inuit voices representing our own stories to like the population of Montreal. So um, that's like why I started it um, with Steven Puskas. And we just wanted to share um, with people like um, our point of view, our stories from our point of view. And basically from that, we just wanted to share films, but we were like, what's the, what's like our way of doing it? And um, it ended up involving like food and games and performances and um, finally films. And it's like, it's honestly, so, it's like so stressful to organize it. But once you're like there doing it, it's like worth everything. Because like you get to share food with everyone, play games. Like one of my favorite things about being in Oak is like usually at this time of year where like playing games together like all being together and it's so much fun. And I think like, like for people who aren't inside of it and like looking in, like a lot of the times you hear, of course, like the kind of negative stories and people don't know like how fun it is and how much like there's like community and love. And so like, I think that's an important thing to me. It's like, being able to be all of the things like it's hard there's hard days and there's also fun days and like when it comes to sharing like what the experience is and what's my perspective it's like you know we have to be able to talk about hard things and also like laugh um so that's what we do at that festival i 
I couldn't oh, remember the rest of your questions. <laughs> oh, it was just, you know, you touched upon it perfectly about how, you know, be, being in communities, how that it was really in, enriching for that, for that creative spark. Um, and the fact that you were planning on doing it this year, so it's fine that <laughs> COVID didn't completely <laughs> change that plan um, was also part of the question. So excellent. Great. Acacia? I saw you on mute. <laughs> I, I think that part of your uh, question was about having community with other creatives, mm -hmm. is that correct? And I think um, that that is really um, important. I think probably more important than I ever consciously understood until it had kind of happened to me, um, especially in the photography world, like especially in like the like media, like editorial types of photography, it can seem like this like complete inaccessible wall and there's no like roadmap there's no way like streamlined way to break into that and to learn and the only ways currently that you can learn about that is just by like meeting other photographers um and so i've been uh lucky a few times in my life um doing various like when i was younger unpaid internships in places and just learning, like meeting people who are working in so many different ways and getting a sense of like the possibilities that are out there and that you don't have to do things a specific way. You can um, learn how to make it work for you. And also I think that um, photography can be in some ways a kind of like lonely thing. Um, I don't know if lonely is the right word. Solitude is like a nice thing, right? <laughs> it's, it's, um, but often you are doing it alone and it can feel kind of weird. Like, whoa, what the heck am I doing? <laughs> I'm just making, you know, creating um, by myself from some inner drive and being able to connect with other people and realize like, oh no, I, I am part of this larger thing. And this is a thing that people do. Um, and it is like a career is really like confirming and heartwarming and, and gives a sense of, of community that's very important now. And so I would encourage people to, to reach out on the internet now for um, communities. You know, you can reach out to people you admire and, and that can like slowly start to build over time. As far as COVID, uh, I hit really a weirdly lucky time. Um, I had stopped going into the field to photograph uh, and to work on ships for my two years of graduate school, which is all now on Zoom. And so that can just keep on going on no matter what is going on in the world. So really dying to be back out photographing, <laughs> um, but I will be patient for now. It's okay. It's a good time to read. And how about you, Eben? I know it, you cut off for a little bit there, just checking to see if you're still with us. You are muted, though. Uh, yes, I am. Excellent. So have you been finding this uh, tough COVID okay. year creatively, um, or is that has been uh, oh. the opportunity to stay at home? <laughs> uh... When this first, uh, when when this uh, pandemic first started out, I was uh, thinking to myself that oh, it it won't reach me up here, this far north. Um, and then a couple months passed, and then there was a first case of COVID uh, here in Gervik, and then that first case moved to fifty cases. That those fifty cases moved to a hundred cases, and my uh, my creative spark kind of was high when I was thinking to myself that oh, COVID won't won't come up here. But now looking at looking at all of these uh, people here in town that that have had COVID or have COVID right now, um, that that really like dim, dimmed my spark because mm -hmm. um, most of the people that I uh, would work with on projects, um, they they're they're all kind of iffy about hanging out because of uh, COVID and it's or the 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 spark is still there i just don't have the have the boost to you know go out and try to talk to people because of the pandemic and um although my my engagement in person is 
is to a low. Um, I'm slow. I'm slow reaching out to people uh, over social media, uh, planning projects for the next uh, season, the, the next upcoming year. Um, so, so is your community is your community my, uh, of creatives? With the, yeah, is your community of creatives more locally, or have you? Uh, do you have a community? um you know internationally as well um i would say more more locally but i've i've done some international work um i've taken pictures and videos for world reindeer husbandry in uh Kaltikeno, norway and i met a couple of uh, photographers and filmmakers over there that uh, earlier this year that that gave me uh, input on on what to expect uh, working working in the cold mm -hmm. and um, I mean the most or the, the majority of the people that I work with uh, are our local people are are my relatives um, and the content creation uh, here in in Utkarvik is is down to or is not 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 down but like there's 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 a good like five or six people here in town that that are actively going out and taking pictures so so it's more local than international thank you excellent um so you did mention salmi uh, and working in Norway, and Acacia, you've done that as well. Um, conversations that I've had with uh, uh, Salmi creatives often um, talk about how filmmaking and photography f uh, can turn into a political act. Um, do you see politics and activism in your work, or is that something that the three of you try to maybe not get too involved with and, and keep it as a, as a creative medium? So is filmmaking and photography a political act for you? And how so? Um, I think it absolutely can be. Um, I, had an ex I didn't really talk about this work in this presentation, but a few years ago, I had an experience of going to a workshop um, that, was, that was really encouraging, kind of like some of the things I repeated, um, encouraging photographers to be thinking about issues that were really critical in their own communities. Um, and so here, um, in Alaska, we had a proposed mine that um, would, if built, would risk um, it, incredible environmental damage and um, damage to the homelands of like over 13 native tribes. Um, and those stories were just getting like completely, completely overrun, like not listened to. Um, and so for two years, I focused on that. Um, and just this last year, we don't know if it's completely dead yet, but the permit, mine's permit finally got denied. And so that was like amazing. So I think that there is, um, I do maybe not as much in my personal work, but in my like journalistic work, I think that photography and filmmaking is absolutely a political tool and it can actually have tremendous impact and lead to change. And so, um, yeah. That's that. Um, in one of my like first classes at art school, can't remember what the class was called, but one of like the first chapters that we did was the personal is political. And at, like first before I was introduced to that idea, I was like really, I think not into the idea of like being overly political in like art um but then basically like you know i grew i learned <laughs> and just like that idea of the personal being political really stuck with me ever since that class and like even if i i think like even if it's not overly political uh even if it's not addressing like a specific issue that's going on socially um i think that like basically my want is to like be healthy and help my community be healthy and like 
because of how the world works, that's political. <laughs> so I think that it all is. Maybe, maybe it all is. I heard another photographer this, earlier this year say um, that all photography is activism in a way that like in the moment that you choose to select like this moment in time, this is what I'm going to preserve and possibly share and, and help other people connect with. There is um, some level of activism in that. And I had never, I don't know if I had like thought about it as, as being the word political, but, may, but maybe it is, maybe that's all related. And you, Ivan, you come from a quite a very political heritage. Uh, to me, uh, photography can be political. Um, it, 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 it just depends on who you're working with. Say, if I'm working with a wildlife uh, company making videos about wildlife in, in, in the North Slope, uh, near, in nearby villages, um, and they're trying to uh, push a view out uh, through a video. Um, I try not to get get too far into that um, while interviewing people, trying to get information on them, or uh, trying to get information about the about the the topic. Um, it's something that I don't really try to engage in conversation mm -hmm. with people, but um, mm -hmm. photography and filmmaking can be uh, political. Um, it's just a really awkward thing to talk about while trying to, you know, create what create what 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 you want to create and. It's it's just a it's it's just a really weird topic to talk about while trying to you know do something you like to do something that something that 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 you had in mind for 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 a while you know and I mean uh, political or political views are ah uh, uh, shoot never mind uh, I. Hard to hard to talk about. No, and I, I I get it. I understand. Sometimes it I can... would need some time to think about it. <laughs> and that that's fine. I, um, I I get what you're trying to say though that it can maybe muddy the waters a little bit. Like you're trying to to do something that you love and you're trying to be creative with it. Um, and not everything has to have a message. At least from from the perspective of of you working on your own projects, right? Um. But yeah, no, I understand completely that it can be a challenging aspect of, of the medium and of interacting with something on a very public sphere, especially if you're sharing things on social media, right? It's, it's out there for, the, for people to consume and interact with. And sometimes you don't have control on how people will react and interact with it. Um, one final tough question and then a fun question. <laughs> um, you, I, I, from my perspective, I don't think they will never not be outsiders going to the north and coming to the north to tell stories and 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 be creative. Um, it's it's something that's maybe a, a, it's, it's inevitable. Um, I think the north and the Arctic has such attraction to so many people around the world, and you know even myself. I'm a, I'm sitting here and I'm a southerner, and I'm you know absolutely fascinated by you know being able to talk to you guys today. So my question to you is. What advice, what would you tell outsider creatives, people who are Southerners, people who are coming into the North to communities or landscapes and wanting to tell those stories as well? And it, you know, again, it comes from a good place. It comes from, from, from a, a, you know, an, an idea of being able, wanting to share those stories. But what should they be aware of? What should they know? What would you tell them? Get out. <laughs> I guess I could start by repeating just a few of the things that I mentioned earlier mm -hmm. in my presentation. Um, I think that uh, intention is really key, um, like overarching. Um, 
I think that going into a place that you're not from, again, time is really important. Um, spending enough time. I, I like to think of like long form photography as kind of like visual listening in a way. Um, I think letting go of preconceived ideas that you have about the Arctic um, or about what you think the, the important part of a story might be. Um, I think really like getting to know people and building relationships and building trust um, and realizing that like time spent not photographing is also really, really valuable. Um, like Asimiak just reminded me of like the winter games. Um, amazing, you know, just be in places with people. Um, and then communication, communicating before photographing, if somebody, if you just even have like an intuitive sense that you shouldn't be, somebody doesn't want you to take a picture, then just like don't take it. <laughs> um, and, and you know, communicating about your intentions and then permission to, to use it later. Um, and then being in a place long enough to be aware of like cultural sensitivities around depictions of certain things. Um, something I was really sensitive to in the beginning was like subsistence hunting and making sure that um, I depicted that in a way that wasn't going to cause anybody any any harm. And like realizing that if you're going to publish somebody's photo, it's a big responsibility, and that might be, you know, the most public photo of that person that might like ever see the light of day. Um, you or be be distributed. You need to think uh, really carefully about that. And um, finally going on and on here, but like specificity and context and, and putting people's own words with their stories, I think is key. Well, I think that that's like a pretty, yeah, it is a difficult question. Um, I think that for many years, like other, like outsiders have been telling stories about Inuit and Northern people and people all over the world. Um, and that like, honestly, like we're still really working through taking our voice back and our story back and un like trying to undo as much damage possible that those works have done to us through the way that like outsiders see us and what they learn from things that maybe didn't fully understand like who we are and why we do things before trying to communicate it, capture it and tell their own story. And so like, you know, like I really feel like, yeah, it's important to listen, to take space and to like, you know, really think of like, like why you're doing something and like if it's the best use of your voice. Like I said before, we all have our own unique experiences of life and we definitely all have things to contribute to share. And it's like really like through my artistic practice, I try to like tune into like what do what do I know and what can I speak to and um what's the best way to contribute with my voice and I think that's like just to encourage everyone to really think about that. Mm -hmm. All right well I'm seeing that we've already gone through our time it's been a fantastic conversation so glad to have you all here today. So my one last question um, and please feel free to have some closing remarks and final things if you'd like to say as well before we finish this webinar. But my last question to everybody is, what is your favorite movie and what is your favorite thing to capture? So what's your favorite subject when you're taking photo or when you're filming? I'll start with Acacia, because you're next to me right here. Um, I'll disclose something potentially nerdy about myself. I think my favorite uh, movies are animated movies directed by Hayao Miyazaki, um, Japanese animator. They're just like full of so much magic, especially um, one called Spirited Away. I particularly enjoy. Um, check them out. 
Love it. Um, and I think really simply, I mean, something that, that, um, that draws me to like the polar regions on like a really general level is just the qualities of light in the far north and, and the far south also. Um, but at extreme latitudes, I mean, in the winter, everything is just like in this like beautiful dream state. And then in the summer, you have like endless sun. It's just that is magical in itself. So awesome. I love Studio Ghibli as well. Princess Mononoke, anytime. And how about you, Asiniak? Um, what was the second question again? Okay, first question was favorite movie, and second question, mm -hmm. favorite thing for you as a, as a creative to capture, thing, favorite thing that you like to take photos of or film? Um, I really like, like, tide pools. Mm -hmm. um, and I really love lichen. And, like, yeah, I love, like, all of the small plants. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I absolutely love that. And then for, like, movies, I love so many different movies. I think it, like, depends. You know, like, there's a good movie for, like, like you know being kind of girly there's a good movie for like beautiful cinematography like I love the French New Wave and I love like like really girly movies from like the early 2000s <laughs> <laughs> um but last night we were watching um View from the Top <laughs> with one of the <laughs> Excellent choice. <laughs> <laughs> and how about you, Yvonne? I don't really have a favorite movie. Uh, <laughs> I don't really watch movies a lot. But um, what I do like watching is uh, National Geographic uh, TV shows and uh, specials about the Arctic and what I'm used to seeing. and. Mm -hmm. um, how how I can relate to something uh, a lot more than just seeing you know like city streets on on a TV show or like that that one coffee shop at the, at at the corner on a like a really big street you know um, and one other thing that I that I uh, like watching is is uh, movies produced by Ar uh, Arctic peoples. Um, What I like to capture is uh, wildlife and uh, the animals that I see around, um, whether it's polar bears, caribou, uh, seals, uh, everything that I, you know, like hunt. Um, and also uh, plants, I guess. Uh, there's, there's all these different plants around my parents uh, on the on the tundra right outside and uh, once you get a really good look at those up close uh, they're they're really interesting um, so just wildlife uh, and plants I guess and the, the setting that I like shooting in is either fog or uh, or the 24-hour sunlight in the in the summertime I wanted to ask uh, if uh, you just mentioned um, films made by um, other Arctic peoples. Have you ever seen the short film called Vision Man? It's made in Kanak in Greenland. Um, it's wonderful. Anyway, I, I have not. Um, I would like to see it, though. I, I wouldn't know where to watch it or find the link or find the video to it. But if I find that it, I'll send it to Kind of interesting. I've seen it as well, as well. It's really cool. So if anyone watching has a link for it, please feel free to share and I'll make sure that Yvan gets it as well. <laughs> and with that, guys, this brings this webinar to a close. Again, I want to thank you all so much, so warmly uh, for joining us today.
um, between the holidays. Um, we had quite a few people come in and quite a few questions. So this was a fantastic talk. And I think a lot of people who are hoping to get into fil filmmaking or photography uh, as Northerners, I think we'll be able to get a lot, of, a lot from this talk. So again, thank you for sharing your knowledge and your experiences. For the, all of you uh, watching us right now, this is our third webinar of the webinar series. We will have two more, one at the end of January and one at the end of February. The subject for next month's webinar is youth stewardship uh, in the Arctic. So uh, we'll have some young activists and conservationists and people who work for, for preserving the land, preserving the Nuna across the north. So I hope you can join us for that talk at the end of next month. Stay tuned um, on all the different media channels uh, to have more information on that. And with that, I think we can bring this webinar to a close. So thank you very much, everybody. Have a safe end of 2020 and a happy and healthy 2021. Take care and cheers. Thank you. Thank you, guys.